Welcome to Trico. I'm Falguni Whedon, welcoming you to Trico's 15th edition. Welcome to Trico 2020. I'm Falguni Whedon, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by interventional cardiologist, Dr. Malcolm Bell. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Bell, if I could start by asking you perhaps to introduce yourself a little bit to the audience. Yeah, sure. I, I'm an interventional cardiologist and a CCU specialist, also the vice chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic in, in Rochester, uh, in cold Minnesota. <laughs> We're really delighted to have you here today with us. Oh. We saw some very exciting cases, live cases over the past 24, 36 hours. We have some live cases going on at Apex at the moment with, with moderation here at the university. Any particular highlights for you? Well, I think that, you know, it really reproduces what we've seen before, but just takes it to another level. Um, Dr. Patel has put together a, an outstanding cast of extremely uh, experienced and talented uh, interventional cardiologists. We saw a number of uh, complex cases yesterday, uh, many different facets of interventional cardiology, uh, with a lot of discussion among you know, international um, uh, panel uh, members. Yes. And, um, and, and again, I think it was something that with the type of cases that they were doing that would bring out many sort of uh, interesting discussion points, uh, you know, new technology, new uh, approaches mm -hmm. uh, and you know, new strategies mm -hmm. you know, to dealing with uh, you know, complex disease. And we'll have a lot of young cardiologists watching online today, a lot in the audience watching our interview now. Any advice that you would like to impart well, that's a, that's a loaded question, but um, so many of these are just starting their uh, careers. Yes. I think that uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for them to learn from real masters yes. uh, of, uh, of these procedures. And, and truly, I mean, for example, we had Dr. Saito uh, yesterday, truly one of the, the world's masters in yes. uh, tackling uh, CTOs. And for him to be here and Amdibad with uh, our uh, junior colleagues uh, watching and learning, is, uh, is an incredible privilege um, and not many people you know, get to, to see that so close up uh, at this stage in their uh, training. Mm. And we've seen the use of technology really come to the forefront mm -hmm. of, of, of healthcare um, from OCT, uh, which we saw being used yesterday. What advice would you give to the young cardiologists in the use of OCT in their day-to-day -day practices? Well, I think it's just not OCT. I mean, I think we need to think about OCT as one of the tools that we have. It's certainly a very exciting uh, technology, but we also saw uh, the utility of intravascular ultrasound yes. yesterday. We did not uh, see any cases of using IFR or FFR, mm -hmm. uh, but these uh, were discussed. Mm -hmm. So I, I see these as tools that help us understand uh, what we should be doing, mm -hmm. learn about uh, um, at, at techniques, what can be optimized. Mm. And in the future, I think that uh, what they need to know is, that, first of all, that these you know, techniques, you know, these technologies mm -hmm. exist. Yes. Uh, but to understand what the technology is telling us mm. and how it works. Mm. And it may be that it's not possible to implement it in their practice, mm. you know, because some of these, are, uh, particularly things like uh, ultrasound and OCT, can be very, very expensive. Yes. And not everyone or every health system can afford to have yes. that. Uh, and it also needs to fit into the flow of your lab. So you have to place priorities. Mm. But to learn you know, from those techniques and to you know, keep up with the literature, listen to the experts. Yes. And, the, and, and as we have learned with other technology in mm. the past, it may be very, very helpful, particularly from a research standpoint mm. or understanding mechanisms of mm. disease or the uh, mechanism of failure of procedures mm. or the success of procedures. And it may be that it's not necessary to use it in every single case. Mm. And so I think you need to understand uh, what the advantages are, yes. what the limitations are. Yes. 
And let's, in the same vein of technology and advancements in healthcare and technology, let's touch on robotics. So we've seen Apex Heart Institute carry out over 500 procedures yes. in the last two years. That's which extraordinary. Is extraordinary. It's the most amount globally. We've then more recently seen five teleprocedures taking place from 32 yes. kilometers away, which really we thought was probably 20 years ago, never possible mm -hmm. in, in 100 years. Um, obviously, subsequent publish, publication in, in The Lancet, which is, uh, which is huge. What are your thoughts on this technology? Has the Mayo Clinic got a finger in the pie of robotics moving forward? Yes, in fact, um, well, first of all, I say it's extraordinary what Dr. Patel ha has done and how he's embraced this so quickly. I mean, over 500 procedures. Yes. And, and I remember when uh, I came here uh, a couple of years ago, I think they had done one or two. Yes. Uh, with respect to what we've been doing, in fact, uh, as a prelude to those five cases that yes. he did, you know, the first in man uh, cases, we actually had uh, done a, the first demonstration of this uh, in an animal study. Um, okay wasn't 32 kilometers, it was probably more like three kilometers, okay. but uh, you demonstrated yes. the, uh, the principle uh, yes. that it could be achieved. To be honest, I'm, I'm not quite sure where that's uh, headed. Yes. I think it's uh, like many technologies, you know, we, we're willing to you know, it, um, explore these yes. and, and what it can do for us. And it may be that it's not going to be tele, you know, stenting mm -hmm. in the future. Maybe it is, maybe, I'm, I'm not yes. quite sure where that's going to fit because yes. It's expensive equipment, yes, and it has to be in the lab. I mean, the the robot, uh, the robot itself. It's not really a robot, but everyone talks of it as a, a robot. Yes. But uh, I think of a robot as a, a robot on an assembly a line physical, in a Toyota, yep, uh, you know, yes, um, you know, car manufacturing, kind of yes. where you push a button and everything, yes. and you sit back and watch everything. So yeah. it's really uh, a robotic assisted um, or a remote uh, mm. assistance. But ne nevertheless. I think that we've got to keep in mind that if we're going to think about where is it going, where's that device going to be, where's that robot going to be? Yes. If it's going to be in some rural area, you still need to have people who know what they're doing in terms of, of you know, and if there is a complication, mm -hmm. then you need to have someone who really knows how to deal with those complications. Sure. So I've got an open mind, I'm just not quite sure where that's going, but I think what happens here with technology is that you learn something else from it yes. and then suddenly a light switch goes on yes. and we can use it for this and yes. I'm not sure what that might be in the future. Yes. One of the things which I think you know, is important uh, for us to uh, keep uh, uh, in sight is the potential for it to take us away from the radiation, take us mm. away from wearing mm. heavy lead aprons. Yes. Um, on the other hand, we still have people around the table mm. who are wearing lead aprons. Of so. Uh, um, it's a very complex uh, situation, but I think that we just need to wait to see uh, how, how it evolves. Mm. So we're, we're trying to do some of the same thing. We, we're not ready to do remote, you know, from one site to, mm -hmm. to another, mm. certainly not on a day-to-day -day basis. No. I, I think that uh, um, the place for that in the future, I think, uh, remains to be uh, seen. But uh, anyway, we're, we're a willing partner in this, and we actually have two robots that uh, we're okay. beginning to uh, uh, use uh, more frequently. Okay. But we're not at the 500 that Dr. Patel is. <laughs> it is fantastic yeah. what Apex Heart Institute have, have achieved to date. Yeah. It re well, maybe it really only is. in India you can have these numbers. But, Who uh, knows? But it, it's, uh, yeah, very exciting times yes. for them. Are there any other technologies that you're feeling very excited about at the moment? Yeah. Well, you know, um, in this meeting, we, we see the same things. We've got catheters, we've got wires, we've mm. got intravascular imaging devices, we've got the robot. Um, and, you know, and we had a nice discussion yesterday about the, you know, the role of uh, rotablator and how we yes. use that and how that can be integrated with mm. intravascular uh, imaging. But I, I think that there, in terms of new devices, we, I mean, we were talking about CTOs earlier and we said, you know, one of the world's masters uh, yes. here. And you know that technology has changed dramatically in the last you know, yes. 10, 15 years. Success rates have gone up uh, mm. extraordinarily. So I think we'll still see you know further ad advancement uh, there. And of course, you know in the structural world, mm. you know with uh, TAVR and, uh, and now you know percutaneous mitral valves, and now yes. we're exploring tricuspid valves. So we're going to see a lot of uh, um, new devices there. Yes. What excites me more though is our ability to detect disease. Mm -hmm. 
uh, before it manifests mm. with a heart attack or mm. sudden death. Uh, also, to improve our diagnostic accuracy. And uh, we haven't really discussed that uh, at, at this meeting. Mm. And, and what I'm getting at is that we've really reached a plateau in terms of how do we detect uh, disease. Mm -hmm. And around the world, and particularly at Mayo Clinic, we're, we're very excited about artificial intelligence. Mm. And uh, so, for example, stress testing, the accuracy of that really hasn't changed dramatically in the last you know, 20, 30 years. But now we're beginning to uh, appreciate that with the help of engineers and looking at even just simple 12 of the ECGs mm. to be able to diagnose disease mm. from a simple ECG, yes. looking at things that only um, you know, a, a neural network can really work out. We're not mm. even sure what it's looking at. Mm. And to tell us that someone has a very weak heart, you know, some severe left ventricular dysfunction mm. or maybe uh, some uh, rhythm uh, issues there, just simply based on an ECG that you and I may look at it and say, that's a normal ECG. Yes. And I think that's very, very exciting. Mm. Um, and it should be relatively cheap. Mm. And so that's an exciting era that I think we're about to, uh, we're really moving into. Mm. And, and we're playing a, a major uh, role there, I, I believe. And this is something that's really going to help our patients. Mm. And that's really what we're here for. Yes. Not to showcase the latest you know, device yes. and what we can do. But what we need to be able to do is have a real impact on our patients yes. on, on a global scale. Yes. And you're still so passionate about your work. What drives you on a daily basis? What, what, make, what keeps you away from the golf course and what keeps you working engaged and, yeah. and driven as you are? That's a pretty easy question. What keeps me away from the golf course is I don't have enough time <laughs> and um, I still have a high handicap. But, uh, <laughs> But no, uh, I think taking care of the patients, the, the satisfaction of uh, you know, talking with patients yes. and improving their lives yes. and, uh, and helping them and, and to see how satisfied they are you know, with that. And, and any time you think that, uh, oh, it's just getting a little boring, but all you have to do is that interaction with yes. patients. But the thing that you're really making a difference in their lives. Yes. And that's really, I think, the privilege of being a physician. Dr. Malcolm Bell, thank you so much for attending Trico 2020, our 15th edition. You're very welcome. Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity thank again. You.